hello! Welcome to Changeling Cast, the podcast dedicated to reading and dissecting urban fantasy, paranormal, and speculative romance series. I'm your host, Mara, from the YouTube channel Books Like Woe, and this season we are making our way through Nalini Singh's Psy Changeling series. And today we are doing a bonus episode that I honestly could not be more excited to share with you guys because I am chatting with none other than Nalini Singh herself, the creator of Psy Changeling series. Honestly, who who better than to talk Psy Changeling with than uh, the creator of the series herself? So uh, we've got quite a treat here with a, a nice deep dive into the series with Nalini Singh. Uh, I do want to let you guys know that there are some spoilers in the sense of if you are not caught up with the series, we do hit a point where we talk a little bit about what has happened up through Last Guard, which is the book that is coming out this July. That's the 20th book in the series. We are currently, as a podcast, at the time of this recording, um, at book six. And so if you don't want to have anything spoiled for you of what happens between book six and book 20, I will very clearly indicate that in the interview when we're going to switch to that. And then I will also leave some timestamps below of kind of when we're going into that section and when we're coming out of it. So just know that going in. But without further ado, first, we have a good like 40 minutes spoiler free uh, with Nalini Singh. So I hope you guys enjoy. Okay, well, guys, I am so excited to tell you that we are chatting today with the the queen, I guess, or the goddess of our our fictional universe we've been inhabiting. Uh, Nalini Singh is here to chat about Psy Changeling. Welcome, Nalini. Hi, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I am beyond tickled pink. Um, Obviously, if you're listening to this, hopefully you know what Psy Changeling is, but uh, if you've not encountered Nalini's other books, they are also well worth seeking out. Um, she has a great contemporary series that has a bunch of hot New Zealand rugby players, so that's great. Uh, she's got a, another paranormal romance series, uh, the Guild Hunter series, which actually you shared the cover for the latest one recently. That has to be one of the most beautiful covers I've seen on a book in a while. Yeah, it's stunning. I love it so much. And um there's a lot of detail in it that's just so perfect for the characters and the book. And yeah, I I I actually am going to get a huge poster of it so I can put it on my office wall and just stare at it. I do not blame you. It I, I pulled it up to full full view on my computer screen and was in awe at the the detail on it. Well, we are up to Branded by Fire in our reread at this point. Um, so if you are listening along and you're not past that, we're going to try to avoid too many spoilers. It's going to be hard for me because I absolutely love book 12. So I'm going to have to hold myself back from asking questions on that. Uh, but I thought maybe we could start with the number one kind of question or speculation we've been having, which is, as I'm doing this reread, I am shocked at how much foreshadowing there is, even from the first book, as to where the series ultimately ends up going. How much planning do you do versus how much are you just reading back into the text um, as you kind of make your way through the series? So it's interesting. I, I don't plan each book, so I don't sit down and make a plan of what's going to happen in each book. I just let the characters show me the way but I do when I write a series I always think about where the series is going so for example the side changeling series begins with silence so we know what silence is and it exists and the question is um what what happens to the side from this point on so like I had to know where we were heading before I began, because uh, this was my first series, Say Changeling. So 
but I had sort of I'd learned from watching television series I'd learned the ones that were really strong with a strong overarching plot line they knew where they were going as opposed Mm -hmm. to the ones that had a really cool concept and and then you could see the writers kind of coming up with stuff as they went along because they hadn't thought about what the end result of that cool concept was Mm -hmm. and so it was really important to me that I had an answer to every question Um, and I don't mean the small questions that come up in each book but the the huge overarching question um, and the question of silence and so that part is planned but not in terms of it's not written down anywhere it's planned in my head so Mm. and once I know once I know that big plot line or where the series is going I find that my subconscious does a really good job of slotting all the pieces together as I go and um, it keeps me from going off on tangents because everything pulls back to that main storyline that main arc that's going through the series Um, yeah so I, I hope that makes sense so there's a there's an element of planning involved but it's it's more on the the overall picture versus the the tiny details i i have a lot of faith in the writing process and in my characters to to make sure the details line up mm. um and there are things i do book to book which in all honesty <laughs> probably only i would notice but for example so i'll take the example of the ghost I won't spoil it. So the ghost is a character, you know, is, is unnamed and unknown for a, for a lot of the series. And so that's a major question. And so when the ghost first appeared, I knew who the ghost was. Like I had mm. to know their identity to write them through multiple books because if you reread the books after you know the ghost's identity, you'll realize that no matter the time zone, no matter which part of the world, this person mm-hmm. is never in two places at the same time. I made sure of that. Um, and so that's what I mean about having the answer to a question. And that means I don't make errors in the books as I go along. Hmm. Yeah, that makes, I mean, in my mind, I I see you as having like the gigantic cork board with the red string kind of pulling it all together. <laughs> but <laughs> that totally makes sense. I think I heard you once mention you love Easter eggs. Um, and I, I feel like I definitely see that as I'm doing this reread of, oh, okay, I wonder if you sort of had an initial idea about so-and-so and how they may come back, you know, in three or four books and have this role to play. Yeah, sometimes it happens like that. Sometimes, uh, every so often I'll put something in and I think it's just a passing comment or something that's interesting, but um, maybe it's just like a little minor point. But then later on I realize, oh, actually, that is, that's actually really strong and uh, it's important to the series. And um, I'm glad my brain put that back there. But um, <laughs> other times I know from the moment a character steps onto the page. Uh, for example, you said you love book 12. So I wrote the opening scene of book 12 when I wrote book two. So yeah, those books oh are like gosh. 10 years apart. <laughs> so... I already knew exactly how book 12 was going to open when the character first appeared in book two. And Mm. every so often it happens like that. Like I have a very strong idea of exactly where um, a particular character is going. And so when that happens, I I just write, I write it, what's come to me, and then I just keep it. And yeah, like I think um, the opening scene, so chapter one, is very similar to what I wrote all those years ago. So after edits and everything, it's still... um, And so I think of those moments like, you know, they're gifts (laughs) from a writing perspective because they just come and they're so powerful and they resonate and, yeah, I just go with it. Yeah, wow. I'm going to have to, like, process that because that is an (laughs) immense amount of just, like, anticipation on your part I would think of just having to hold have that know that that's sitting in your back pocket and just waiting for the right time to get there oh you have no idea you have no idea (laughs) (laughs) I was I was like when can I actually like work on this because um 
like literally you know certain things happen in a certain time you had to get the characters mm-hmm. to that point you had to get the world to that point so it would happen when it was its time but for me you know i i knew um what was coming and so it's like have knowing the worst spoiler of all time and not being able to tell anybody about it. <laughs> well, and you say kind of the right right time for it. I think, especially as I'm going back through, I'm having such an appreciation for your skill at balancing sort of what I would describe as the micro plot versus the macro plot in each book um, and kind of having... I mean, I, I, I mentioned to you, I binged this series the first time I read it. I could not. I mean, I, I think I read it maybe in two weeks. I could not put it down. Oh, wow. But I think it's because you have this really lovely balance between you're very invested in those particular characters of the story in that book. But you're also you can't wait to find out, you know, what's happening with the side council. And oh, my gosh, this guy got assassinated in the last book. What's going to happen? You know, what's the fallout for that? Do you kind of just find that balance instinctively or is that something that you kind of consider of, okay, I think, you know, this is the right time for this to happen and then that will kick off this, this and this? Uh, I would say it's more instinct. I'm generally more an instinctive writer. Um, And particularly when I write my first draft, it's all it's all just instinct. I just sit down and write. Mm -hmm. I I have maybe a few very sketchy notes and then I just go. But um, in terms of when I look at it to see, hey, does this have the right balance? Um, it would be in the editing stage when I've got mm. like quite a clean draft. But um, I think a lot of it just comes from what I love about writing this series, which is that I love it is very romantic, mm-hmm. but I also love that it has this huge overarching plot going on, and so whenever I'm writing, I, I'm aware of both those things. So I think a lot of the balance just happens because I've constantly, um, I'm in that world, you know, I'm, I'm living the story and I know that each element is as important as the other. And, um, so yeah, every so often I do have to go back and, uh, obviously look at, does the scene really need to be here? Or maybe we, we need another scene, um, in the romance um, that needs to be visible um, because I've sort of raced past it because I've been, there's been something really exciting going on in the plot. So those kind Mm -hmm. of things do happen in the, in the editing stage, but in general, I would say just, I, when I get into the zone, I'm, I'm living in that world. It, it's quite instinctive. The one thing I do actually have to be very careful about is as the cast expands, you know, I have this, um, just like readers, I love all the characters, you know, there's so <laughs> many characters I love. And so that's one thing I actually have to be very conscious about is who comes back onto mm. into each book, because we want to see everyone, like I want to see everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, you know, you can't have a big reunion in every book, because it's, that's not their story, you know, and um, characters only come back when they have a role to play in each book so I have to be very strict with myself about that and I do that's a conscious process I like I think about it okay I'm bringing this person back do they really need to be here Mm. and um so yeah so that's that's one thing I would say I do very consciously and as an aside it's actually probably why I write you know all the short stories and stuff I do for my newsletter (laughs) because I'm like okay I haven't seen this person for a really long time I'll just check in on them (laughs) so that's that's my way of balancing my need to see people you know all these characters um but keeping the the plot of the current book like tight and focused on the the central protagonist in that book yeah I think um that makes a lot of sense and I think it's a good instinct I mean similarly of course I would love I mean if you just wanted to write a book hanging out with all of these guys (laughs) I, I mean we would read it um but I think it's a good impulse to sort of keep keep the momentum of the story going and it keeps it feeling fresh. But, well, I'm, I'm glad you choose to do that because I love your novellas. I feel like they're always a nice little deepening of what we've seen of the different characters. So, Well, so one thing, we're not at this point yet in our reread, 
But this series does something kind of unique. I don't know that I've ever seen a series do kind of its overall series management this way before, which is that you very consciously chose to have, I guess, kind of season one and then a season two or a series one, a series two. How has that transition been for you as you're trying to have cohesion for the story as a whole, but you have these kind of two distinct plot arcs? Has that been an easy transition or? Um, yeah, it has been. It's actually worked quite well because I, I did think about it because originally, um, you know how we talked about having an answer uh, for the question I asked. Mm-hmm. And so without spoiling it, I'll say by the time you get to Allegiance of Honor, there has been a big shift in the world. So the, the question mm-hmm. has been answered. Um, and what we began with is no longer what we end up with. There has been a big shift. And so it felt like a natural transition point because, again, uh, at that point, we have a different question because Mm. now society is at that point. And when I originally thought about it, I thought, oh, well, that will be the end of the series. But then when I got to it, I realized, oh, actually, it's a new beginning, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a very natural new beginning because it's like, well, what do they do now? Because they've kind of fixed some stuff, but it's there's a lot of stuff that's really messed up that's come to light. And so mm-hmm. it felt like a very natural transition point. And I also thought, I know the series, you know, the first arc is uh, 15 books. And so I knew that felt quite overwhelming to a lot of readers. Mm-hmm. And so another reason I, I thought, oh, well, I need to make it clear that they can actually start at Silver Silence because it is a natural entry point again into the series Mm. because season two asks a different question to season one. So um, I know a lot of people began with Silver Silence and then went back and read the previous books and they were fine. So, um, but yeah, for me, from a writing perspective, it was, it just did feel really natural and also it, meant that with Allegiance of Honor, you know, it's a nice, um, I felt like it was a nice, not a close, but just a nice ending to that arc. And then we got to see everyone and we did get to hang around with them. That's the book (laughs) where you get to Mm -hmm. hang out with the characters from the first arc and kind of see what's up with everyone. And then in Silver Silence, then I could actually shift geographically as well Mm. into a totally different area and because it was the start of a new arc, you know, a new season, um, it was okay to sort of begin at that point in a completely different um, clan. Um, and go, you know, we'd been with the wolves and um, the leopards, and then now we're with the bears um, in a different part of the world. So even though the series is interconnected, um, it it's fresh again in a new way Mm -hmm. which is great for me as a writer as well because I'm very conscious of writing books that are constantly developing the world I want us to see new Mm. new characters I want us to have new plot developments um and I love doing that from the writing side as well it's you know when I write I'm spending up to six months with a book and I have to be really excited about it and so Mm -hmm. for me it's it's great too to constantly be opening up new pathways into the world um finding new characters to fall in love with and I mean the bears just kind of came in and Mm -hmm. got into my heart and you know I never saw them coming but then there they were and um you know so that's it's it's fun it's uh, so yeah it's been a it's been a good transition I think from the writing side um yeah and it's continuing so I'll let you know how it happened, you know, how it all goes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, um, yeah, uh, uh, Allegiance of Honor, I feel like I called that the um, chessboard being reset. It felt like slide, sort of, you know, okay, we're putting all of our, our pawns away. We're going to have some of them come back, but we're kind of starting over. So I think that definitely worked too for long-term readers of the series. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Like uh, I remember discussing that book with my editor and I was like, I'm not sure – what readers will feel about this book because it's not the story of just one couple you know it's it's the story Mm -hmm. it's an entwined story of this entire group of people that we've come to know but 
Um, and so I've been really happy that readers have enjoyed it. And and I'm really happy I wrote it because to me it felt like there were certain characters and certain storylines that had to be tied up before that series arc could switch. And um, one small thing, for example, is um, without spoiling, I'll say, you know, the boy who, who saved Annie um, from the train crash. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that was that's just a small thing, um, but it meant a lot to me. And, and I think it meant a lot to the, the, the readers who were following along on that particular storyline. And so we, we got like closure on, on that. And um, so I didn't want to leave lots of things hanging on that part of the storyline before we shifted to, you know, the new arc. Yeah. Well, and, you know, there's so many lovable characters from that first arc we still get to see occasionally. Um But yeah, I mean, this new arc, you have a whole new set of characters to fall in love with, and you have a whole new set of characters who are um, kind of being set up to be morally gray, or or we're getting to at least see their development from the first arc as being maybe the bad guys, and now they're maybe a little bit more complicated. As you live with these characters long term, what to you... So for instance... Like, I don't see a way where, you know, Enrique, had he lived, um, could, could become one of our heroes or like Ming Laban. I don't I don't see it for him. But we do have, you know, some characters who go from being quite uh, problematic, let's say, in the first arc. And as time goes on, we have more and more sympathy with them and, and we get to know them better. What kind of separates the characters who can be redeemed from the ones who you feel like you kind of can't do that with? Um, I guess it's it's more instinctive again. For example, you know, Enrique, he's he's a serial killer, so you know, yeah, no, there, not there great. was there was really nothing <laughs> there <laughs> that you could. He he just um, he was just a very sort of evil character, and he was always evil. Um, Ming again is an interesting one because we've seen him from so many perspectives of different characters, and he has constantly made decisions that are. Uh, just horrible, you know, uh, and, mm-hmm. and evil and cruel. And so, but with other characters, um, they have made some very bad decisions. But at the same time, if you make a terrible decision for a good reason, what does that make you? And I find that a really interesting question. And I think mm-hmm. probably Nikita is the best example of of this question because... Yeah. She's done some terrible things, and no doubt about it, but at the same time, she was protecting her child, and she has managed to bring that child up to adulthood, um, and that child has become like this a trigger for a change in the, the entire structure of you know society. And so it's, she's, that's, that makes her more complicated um, as opposed to someone who does things um, for the cruelty of it, as, as for example, Santana Enrique did. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain. I guess it is instinct for me as a writer. Some characters surprise me. And, and that's another thing. There are always characters who are surprising. And I really enjoy writing those characters because they're not easy. They're... Mm. Um, in any way because I still grapple with who is Nikita you know she she continues to show new facets of herself and as a character she is so contained and so used to shielding herself and protecting herself that it's actually difficult to get to know her so we only see glimpses Mm -hmm. of her and each glimpse shows something different about her but of course, it can work in the other direction too, and that you think someone is is maybe a good person, and then layer by layer, you're like, I'm not so sure about this person anymore mm. because they're hiding things. And um, so, yeah, it's just uh, for me, it's not so much a decision I make as it is that I'm writing and I get into the character and I realize, okay, this person is maybe not black and black or white this person is morally gray 
and um, they could go in either direction. And then I just have to keep on writing to figure out where they're going to end up. Yeah, I think that infuses the storylines too with a lot of kind of energy and suspense because I think of an example early on, you know, Anthony, who we find out relatively early on is not all he appears to be. Um, but it was an exciting moment to realize that, you know, in the, I think it's the third book that, no, no, he, he really, you know, don't, don't lump him in necessarily with the other kind of powerful side you've met so far. He's kind of playing all sides of the fence. So I, I think as a reader too, it creates a lot of verve to not totally have the characters pinned down into one little box. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I like reading those kind of characters and as a writer, I, I enjoy writing them as well. And I think particularly because you see this a lot in the, the older generation of Psy and and I I think it's natural to see that in that generation because they've lived in a completely different time, mm -hmm. um, in a completely different society. And so it's shaped them in different ways. And some of them have gone one way, some of them have gone another way some of mm. them have chosen to protect their children and some of them have chosen to abandon their children and so it's it's all this you know there's so much complexity there to explore and um and yeah that's part of why I love writing in this world because there is so much to explore there is so much to find out um so yeah I love it yeah <laughs> No, same. I mean, I, and actually this transitions nicely because I have, I have a whole laundry list of themes <laughs> we've been talking <laughs> about that I want to get your perspective on. But one thing I was reflecting on was how I, people ask me for read-alike titles for this series all the time because everybody knows I love the series. They get hooked on it and they're like, okay, what do I read next? And I'm like, I, the closest thing out, you know, I obviously go to Guild Hunter if you like this one. Um, but besides that, the closest thing that I've been able to recommend is the In Depth series, because there is this really fascinating blend in this series of political thriller and the paranormal romance. And like the number of iterations and kind of areas you have to explore within the world you've set up, it seems kind of endless. Like I, I don't see a natural conclusion really to the series. Yeah, this this series, I think there there is so much room for growth in it because it is the development of a world alongside you know the the romantic relationships, and that's um, I'm fascinated that you chose in death because that is one of my all time favorite series of oh. forevermore. <laughs> yes, same. But um, yeah, I think uh, it is. So I started writing this series because I couldn't find exactly what I wanted to read. And um, I think from my perspective, another one I would recommend that I really, really love, it's completely different, but again, it has that same balance of world building and then it's got the, the romances. So it's actually published um, under, you know, by Bain, which is a science fiction imprint, but there are a number of romances within the, the series, which is the Liadin books by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Um, and some of those books are adventures, some of those books are full on romances. Um, and, but what makes me recommend them is that they have that cohesion of family, um, relationships, mm. and this complex world. And I think. I love it in the same way I love the J.D. Robb books because I like to see not just character growth. That's really important. I want to see character growth, but I also want to see world growth. You know, I want to see new facets of the world. And I mm -hmm. feel like I see that in both of these books. Obviously, the J.D. Robb books are like mystery suspense, so we get to see it from that perspective. We get to see, you know, different parts of the world she explores in each case um whereas with the Liadin books we get to see you know it's science fiction so you get to see the actual world building and the politics going on in the world so um yeah that that's another one I would recommend I agree with your JD Robb of course because I'm completely a fangirl of that <laughs> series <laughs> 
Yeah, no, well, I definitely I made a little typing note here to myself that I need to look up that series for sure. Um, yeah, in death, I, I have actually been I, I was going to ask you, was that a conscious influence? Because I really see a lot of parallels in this reread, um, particularly in Slave to Sensation. It seems quite similar in a lot of its kind of structure to Naked in Death. Um, and I see a lot of parallels between Lucas and Sasha and even Rourke. Um, no, I wouldn't say so because I, I'm trying to remember when I first read the series and first read Naked and Death and it was like years and years and years before I wrote um, mm. uh, Slave to Sensation. So if there is any echo, I think it would be very unconscious. Um mm. Yeah, I'm not sure I see the, the 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 similarity, but then I see it from a totally different perspective than a reader, you know. So for me, I, they live so vividly in my head um, mm -hmm. as completely different characters, even in their personalities. Um, you know, Sasha is so much softer than Eve. In yeah, for sure. When you see her and. Um, and the world obviously is structured differently. But again, I see it from the writing side and you're seeing it as a reader. So I, I have no idea. <laughs> but no. Um, yeah, no, um, it wasn't conscious uh, at all. But um, I'm glad to be mentioned in the same breath as, you know, my hero. <laughs> so it's all good. <laughs> yeah, no, I mostly I see it in the sense of um, Sasha kind of having this intrinsic trauma that's really shaped who she is. And then she's meeting this guy who she has sort of an intrinsically antagonistic relationship in this case, obviously, because it's Psy versus Changeling rather than in, in death, Eve is this cop and she's, you know, getting ensnared with this kind of rakish reformed criminal. So the kind of push pull there, I don't know, maybe it's because I just, I also love in death and I just see it everywhere, but um, <laughs> I felt like uh, I felt like there could be some echoes there. I guess I'll just transition, <clears throat> excuse me, into just peppering you here with <laughs> some other things that we've been talking about. So silence in terms of, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about um, if you have a direct metaphor in mind for silence, because as we've been going through each book and kind of thinking about what kind of parallels to the real world or what it could have metaphorical resonance with like <clears throat> some of the ones we've we've talked about are you know totalitarianism or um potentially a metaphor for s the nefarious side of the internet or or kind of media writ large um emotionally abusive families fundamentalist religion elite corporations so i mean i just feel i mean to me that's a, a sign that it has a level of metaphorical richness to it that the reader can kind of read in what they want. But for you, when you were creating the concept of silence, did you have a specific kind of parallel to the real world you had in mind? Or did it just kind of flow out of the nature of the side themselves? Yeah, when I write, uh, because I write so instinctively, I tend not to think like that. I tend just to be obsessed with the story. And mm. And so even now, um, I like to leave it up to the reader. Um, years back, I read a quote and it said, every reader reads a different book, um, mm. you know, when they read the same book. And I think that's really beautiful. And I actually think as a writer, I shouldn't be making those, um, what should I say? What's the, um, like in terms of themes or metaphors and things like that, I shouldn't be the one making decisions on that or, or saying what I uh, what I see necessarily because I think when an author says that it quite often can stop debate um, and discussion mm. because people start to think well that must be the right way and um, of course it's not because I wrote the book um, and my words are out there and then it's up to the reader to to see what they um you know, to read it um, according to their own thoughts and um, to see what they see in it and then have those discussions with other readers. So even if I did have something, I probably wouldn't say it. Mm, <laughs> but I, I love that. I, 
yeah, I think it's there's a point at which I think authorial intervention should stop. Like it's mm. it's different from a reader asking me if another character is going to have a story. I mean, that's that's I would un- happily answer that. But if someone's asking me about more in terms of um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm having this brain freeze. It's like um, like the authorial intent. Yeah, like if you're talking about authorial intent or what is the, you know, what are the thematic things and things like that, things that go beyond the basic, you know, the story or like the factual story elements. I've, um, the further I get into my career, the more I realize that I need to step back from that and let readers have that discussion among themselves Mm. because that's a really joyful space because obviously I am a reader and I love talking about what stuff means in books, you know, that I'm a fan of. And I love that open space to discuss where nobody has said, no, this is the right thing. This is what you should be feeling or thinking Mm. as you read. (laughs) Um, And so I want to leave that open space for my readers as well. No, I really love that. I, you know, there's especially, I don't know if it's because of quarantine or whatever, but authors have been really kind of getting into it, especially on Twitter uh, in the last year. So I think that there's actually a lot of just both for your, you know, kind of respecting the joy of the reader to read in what they want, but also just for your own sanity, um, (laughs) kind of giving space for people to do what they, to read into it what they want. Mm. And I think um, for me as a writer, I I also like, um, so I've written a book and by the time it hits the bookstore um, or the e-reader, I'm usually, it's usually been at least six or more months Mm -hmm. and I'm already in the space of another book. And so my head is in a different place. And so... I can listen to those discussions, but um, I do have enough distance to it that I don't need to get involved. You know, it's like, okay, I've written this book and I've put it out into the world. um, And now I suppose it's my gift to readers now, just, you know, and they can read it as they wish. So, yeah, yeah, if that makes sense. No, it totally does. And, you know, I think this is the kind of, series that has it it invites a lot of speculation both from a sort of like oh what do you think is going to happen but also um especially now that i'm reading them kind of in close succession with an eye towards it you know i think there's enough going on in the text that there's a lot to kind of think through and play with and yeah like you're saying i think different people will come to kind of different um things that resonate with them like this this time in my reread i'm really noticing how many uh, complicated sibling relationships there are, specifically sisters. It seems like there's a lot of um, difficult sisters. I mean, I guess Amara being kind of the <laughs> chief among them. But, um, you know, I totally didn't even pick up on that the first time. But now I'm, I've am i kind of got my eye out constantly of like, okay, if you got a troubled sister, maybe that's going to come back up at some point. <laughs> that's, um, it's actually fascinating. I, I, I hadn't actually thought about that myself which is what I mean when I say that I write and then readers tell me things and I'm like, I had no idea that was in there. <laughs> the knowingness of the text. It, uh, yeah. It, yeah. Apparently, it's... you know, at least in these early books, you were, you were working something out about, about sisters. Um, well, one other thing that we've been talking a lot about just in kind of, so these books have aged really, really well. I guess that's kind of the first statement genre fiction often doesn't really age that well. It's not meant to, it's meant to be sort of responding to its cultural moment, et cetera. But, you know, we're 15, I guess, years on. And I think these early books honestly read pretty much like they could have been written today. Um, One of the reasons I think is because these are intensely interracial books in terms of the characters or diverse characters, which I don't know was all that common kind of when you first started writing. Um, I just, I wonder, it seems like that's a real value to you, um, at least in this series. And I just wondered if you kind of had any thoughts about 
how the diversity of what we in the real world world would consider race in the books, um, how that maybe bumps up against the kind of quote unquote interracial nature of psi versus changeling versus human. Um, yeah. Um, so first of all, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really happy that the books have, you know, aged well. And I think part of it is of course that they're set in an alternate world. And, um, mm-hmm. I think often speculative fiction ages better than uh, perhaps contemporary fiction because contemporary by its nature is in a moment in time, whereas speculative fiction can can take place often in any moment in time and the, the themes will resonate. But um, I remember after I wrote Slave to Sensation, I got uh, emails from readers saying, how happy they were to see, you know, representation in the book. Mm. And until that moment, I actually hadn't realized what I had done. And um, I think it comes from who I am as a person and where I've grown up. I've grown up, you know, in, in very diverse cities. And it just was natural for me to write, write the kind of diversity, you know, I see in the world. And mm-hmm. um, and then, you know, I did later on, you know, once the emails and things started coming, I became more conscious of it. But at the same time, it is still a natural instinct to write that way. And it was a conscious decision on my part to use the word race um, in terms of the psi and the changelings and the humans as opposed mm-hmm. to using species. Mm-hmm. Because I think... Um, the word race makes it clear how similar we all are and yet we have these artificial divides that um, that we put between people. And, and I think seeing that in a um, fantasy or paranormal context sort of kind of makes it easier to see and um, process perhaps. Um, But again, a lot of what I do is very instinctive. So um, sometimes I think of this stuff afterwards, but I do remember choosing that one word because I wanted to make it clear that these were not like different species of people. These Mm -hmm. were the same species of people um, and different aspects of it, you know, and um and so the, the the heart of the series has always been diverse and it always will be because that's it just feels right for the world. It feels right for me as a writer. And, um, yeah, and I keep hoping that it isn't always an unusual series in terms of diversity. I hope, you know, mm. that we get more series that are um, just naturally diverse where it's not a point, <laughs> you know, it's just mm-hmm. it just is. Um, and that's one of the things I'm really proud of with the series, which is the diversity is simply woven into the fabric of the series. The, you know, mm-hmm. my readers, just nobody blinks at at um, uh, who the characters are or where they come from. And, you know, it's everyone knows that it could be, they could come from anywhere in the world, you know, they could be of any ethnicity as we think of it. And, um, and it's fine. And it, you know it's it's Mm -hmm. I think I hope that people see the success of this series and realize that you can write you know really diverse works and Mm -hmm. and you know readers are so generous and and with their hearts and they'll they'll take all these characters into their hearts so I hope if there's a you know there's younger writers or newer writers sort of hesitating with diversity I would say don't You know, just go with it and you'll find your readers. Yeah. Well, and I, yeah, I, I, I often find myself getting misty eyed in these books where I, when I reflect on, you know, like for instance, the Omega protocol that comes up in um, hostage to pleasure and this idea of, okay, you can try to unleash this just on the side, but like, (laughs) it's not going to be limited to just the side, like the changelings, the humans, everyone will get it. It's, we have for however different these characters might be, they really do have a a shared destiny. And I think that's kind of driven home again and again, that you can't just 
it can't be one of these races over the other, that they all are in it together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, before I get too emotional, I will uh, w- warn people, if you have not caught up with the series yet, I'm going to ask a couple of questions about Last Guard, because I loved it. Um, and, you know, I know it's the new one coming out. So if you're not caught up with the series, and you don't want to hear any whiff of a spoiler, um, now is the time to, to depart. I'll put a I'll put some timestamps in as well. But Last Guard. Oh, Okay, I'm so excited that we have two Psy again, because those are my favorite, and I'm just a sucker for that. Um, so, oh gosh, I don't even know where to start. So Anchors. Anchors mm-hmm. come up like in the first couple of books, and now we finally are getting the full kind of story on how they fit into the world. What what made this the right time to start kind of exploring Anchors and their function in the Synet? Well, um, so again, you know, another spoiler warning. So <laughs> if you haven't <laughs> caught up, so it, it has to do, it's obviously based on what's happened to the Synet to this point. The Synet is at a critical juncture and and you can't talk about the Synet without talking about the anchors. And mm-hmm. especially at this critical point in time, it's like speaking about a house without speaking about the foundations. You know, it. It can't, without the foundations, the house will collapse. And so that's what the anchors are. They are the foundations of the Synet. And so it was time they came out of, you know, the shadows. It was time we learned who these people are, Mm. are always in the background. As you say, they've existed since book one. So they've always been there. And just like, you know, I think that I say this, you know, in the book, which is that just like we take the foundations of a house for granted, we take anchors for granted because mm-hmm. they're just always there. And so this was the right time because um, with the sign it um, in the state it is in, um, no other designation in the Psy is as close to the problems as the anchors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, it's not that it's not been brought home in the last few books, but this was really the book that made me, um, you, you, you find a way to do this because I know it's a romance. So I know everything's going to work out. Okay. In the end, like I know that in my head, but, um, yeah, the sign that feels like it's in real, you know, dire straits. And I, this, for some reason, this book, it just really was drawn, like kind of really drilled home of, no, no, like we, we've got to figure out a solution here because, you know, things are really hitting the fan. Yeah, I think um, I'm trying to say things without spoiling the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, I'll just agree with what you said. <laughs> yes. Uh, basically, shit gets real in this book. So strap in if you, <laughs> as you're, uh, as you're um, preparing to read this one. Yeah. Um, do you so we do get a new setting in this book? So do you foresee us spending more time kind of around Delhi or with the Rao organization as it as the books move forward or I think uh we'll definitely um you know see Pyle again because she is so important. She she um in terms of what her position ends up being in this book. Um but in terms of locations, it's it's always open. Um, we're moving mm-hmm. around a lot in the series at the moment. Um, and I honestly have no idea where else we're going to end up. But I think we're going to be back in Moscow again um, because Yay. so many people are based in Moscow. And, um, yeah, and, and I think we will go back to... Again, trying not to be spoilery, go back to Delhi just because of the connections that end up being made in this book. Um, you know, it's all linked by people. And so where there are people that are integral to the storyline, of course, we're going to end up there again. So, yeah. So watch the space in terms of where we're going to go next. <laughs> Yeah, no, I've I've really enjoyed that about the second season, so to speak, that we're kind of getting outside of California more and more and kind of seeing um, a bigger picture of what's going on, which I mean, we we definitely got that in the past, but it it feels like that's been a conscious choice to sort of 
mix up locales a lot more in this this season. Yeah, it um it just happened really naturally in terms of where the storyline was going because um it was like okay, who's where and it makes sense that in a world like this, you know, where there's these big political cultural shifts happening that it's not going to be limited to one area. Um, there's going to be people scattered all over the place that are um, playing big roles in what's happening. And so it's been really fun to to go and explore. And actually, a lot of them have been mentioned in the first arc of the series. For example, the bears. I can't remember which book they were first mentioned in, but um, I know they were mentioned more than once in the first, um, you know, first arc of the series. And so we've always known these people existed. Pyle as well was also mentioned. I want to say it was in Shield of Winter, but... Um, oh, I'll keep my eyes open when we get there. Or Shards of Hope. Yeah, so the, the, they're not coming out of nowhere, you know, that the world has been created um, in a way that is global. And so now I get to sort of, you know, explore a bit more in depth into all of these places that we've caught glimpses of. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, I just finished my Branded by Fire reread, and that was the first name check of Selinka, and then the first mention of the bears, that at least that I noticed. Um, so, yeah, they've been they've been kicking around for quite some time before they finally get to shine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think that we're going to get anything else from the Merkins in the next few books? Because they seem like such a... They're, a very they almost feel um like a changeling pack kind of in their dynamic but yeah I, they're um, obviously sigh i yeah they're i love the mccants they're just they're fascinating and i think yeah. yes they will be back because they are they are very important to everything that's happening and in terms of if you think about who is connected um who is connected to their family and um yeah, and I think I won't say much more than that because it's it's you know part of the story of Last Guard um, is yeah. that whole McCant family thing. So um, yeah, they're they're actually one of the cores, you know, the core anchors of the series, just like Dark River and um, Snow Dancer and you know the certain elements of the story, whether they're they're present in every book or not. Um, they're still out there and they're still playing a very big role in everything that's happening in the world. So they will be flowing in and out. Yeah, they, they really, um, they feel to me very much like the changeling packs at this point, just because we're, you know, we, we meet new ones obviously, but um, just the level of loyalty that they have and sort of the ride or die they are for their family. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah, it definitely they feel it feels very cozy, which is a weird thing to say about a group of Psy, <laughs> but it does feel very cozy coming back to them. Yeah. Well, and I guess my last just squee moment is Caleb. I loved him in this book. <laughs> if you were a lover of Caleb like I am. Um, I was early on, I was thinking like, oh, this actually reminds me a lot of Caleb's story. And then did you know pretty early on he was going to have you know, a role to play in this particular story? I'm trying to remember when I was writing how it happened. And I think when he appeared, I just was, oh, of course he's going to (laughs) appear. Of course, it's just perfect. He's going to appear here. So um, I'm not sure I knew necessarily early on, but I knew he would be present in the book just in terms of the storyline. Um, Obviously, he would be present in terms of who he is in the the ruling coalition. Um, Mm -hmm. But there's a particular scene that I I think you're probably thinking of and I'm thinking of. That was a bit of a surprise. Um, But then it felt so good when I wrote it and I felt and it felt so real. And and I and I felt like we saw another part of him. And Mm. yeah, that that felt like, yes, of course this needs to happen and um yeah I hope readers feel that way too yeah it it felt really satisfying and it just it reminded me I mean we think of Caleb as sort of the big I I guess in theory he's the most powerful person really in the world but it's just such a reminder that actually the most powerful person in the world is Sahara (laughs) she kind of is the 
<laughs> I, um, she, she's calling the shots and in everything having to do with Caleb. And and I actually love some of his mental asides about like Sahara and how she's, you know, making him, you know, like sort of um, because of her, he's making certain decisions, and it's um, I find it quite amusing even, um, that he's conscious of it. But at the same time, you know, the whole thing with Caleb is he's very conscious of who he is. And he's conscious of the influence Sahara is on him. And mm-hmm. and I find that a really interesting dynamic because he is so very powerful and yet he has handed her sort of the control over his power mm-hmm. in many ways. And so, um, yeah, I just uh, their dynamic is just fascinating and I'm glad we got to check in on them in this book and see a bit more of them and... And I, I think we're definitely going to be seeing more of them in the future too because, they're again, with writing a series, one of the best things is that I get to explore characters beyond their book. So we got to see their growth. And I think they're one of the couples where you see so much growth um, mm-hmm. as from book to book to book. Yeah. Well, and, you you know, I think for me they're one of those couples where their happily ever after was so – hard one that it's very satisfying to see them actually getting to live it and to grow in it. Um, you yeah. Know, some of the other couples, I mean, obviously they all have their struggles, but it's like, Oh God, they really went through it. They deserve to be happy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were like separated and, you know, they had the whole sort of you know, imprisonment and it's just, yeah. And, you know, raised by a serial killer. So I think there's, there's <laughs> a lot to details. unpack. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> They 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 deserve you know, you know to check in on them, um, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I have been chatting your ear off here for quite some time, so we'll we'll start to wrap this up. But uh, um, obviously, Last Guard comes out this July. But anything else you want folks to know about um, what's going on with you and and your writing? Um, I'm actually currently. Um, sort of noodling away at my next contemporary so uh, and this is the Danny who is the last Bishop Becerra brother yes left so I know readers have been waiting for that and um, I didn't kind of want to talk about it until I was a bit into it because um, I just wanted to make sure you know that it was there was a possibility of this possibly coming out this year. So um, I'm quite a way into the first draft now. Um, so there is a vague possibility of it coming out possibly sometime this year. Um, but, or if it doesn't, it would be, I think, um, early on um, in the next year. And um, and then, of course, I have Archangel's Light coming out um, October. <laughs> Nice. and um yeah so and then um, um and then yeah probably the best way to keep in touch with me is um join my newsletter I I'm pretty regular about sending that out once a month and um I tend to have the most breaking updates in there and um yeah at the moment that's what I'm working on and then after I finish that I will be working on the next side changing book but I'm still in the thinking phase of that, so I can't give you any kind of spoiler for that. Uh, I like to have like quite a few months where I just let the characters do what they will inside my head and then I mm. get to a point where I'm like, oh, okay, I I have the idea for the story and I start writing. And, um, yeah, so probably in a few months I'll be talking about that. Nice. Well, I mean, I, I feel selfish being like, oh, I want a side changeling book. I'd like another contemporary. If you can get another <laughs> thriller, that'd be great. <laughs> so we're, I guess we're just lucky that you, uh, you're able to keep up a pretty um, aggressive writing schedule. So we're, we're just blessed with that, but it must be tiring. So we appreciate your work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I enjoyed. I love writing and um, yeah, I just like to pace myself to what is works for me because I think I'm very particular about the books that come out so for example with the side changing series I will often spend a couple of weeks checking the continuity 
because it's really important. And that's one of mm-hmm. the strong, strongest things about the series is the continuity. So that if you do read the books back to back to back, um, the threads should all line up. Uh, and then, but that means, you know, I have to have, I need to make sure I spend that time. And, and I do. And so I, I always make sure whatever my writing schedule, it's structured in a way where I don't feel like rushed so that I feel like mm-hmm. threads are, are hanging and I haven't checked the continuity because that would just horrify me. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have a book out there like that. So, um, yeah, it's really important to have that space to, to first of all think about the story and then also to have that space to tie up all those, um, you know, small it sounds like small points when I when I check them, you know, like I'm checking a timeline, I'm checking someone's clothing, you know, simple things like that, but they add up to a bigger hole in a book mm-hmm. because they add to the depth of the story and they add to the depth of the overall series. They definitely do. I guess speaking as somebody who's like doing a deep reading of them right now, <laughs> um, I, I definitely appreciate those details being there and it's... Um, yeah, I, I do also think that contributes to the bingeability of the series as a whole is that it feels, you know, it really feels like it gets momentum and just everything is slotting into place as you're clicking along. So it's like, well, I can't I can't stop now. It's all <laughs> it's all just rolling along and I, I have to just hold on for the ride. Um, so I think that attention to detail is very, uh, very much appreciated. Oh, that's music to my ears. Binge away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much for chatting with me and, um, for writing this wonderful series. I know it's, it's been a great comfort to me and many others. So, um, yeah, I just appreciate you putting it out into the world. Well, thank you. And thank you for, um, you know, doing a podcast about the books and, uh, doing a read along and chatting about it. It's, um, the best thing for a writer is word of mouth from readers. So I have to say thank you to, you and every reader who has um, gone out there and spoken about the books and told friends about it. And um, yeah, I hope you continue to fall in love with the books and continue to enjoy this world and the characters. Yeah. Well, you heard her, heard her guys. Get out there and spread the good news of the, the Church of the Side Changeling. <laughs> we, need, we need more members. So, uh, well, thank you so much, Nalini. Thank you. Oh. What a joy, guys. I went into that interview a huge fan. I come out of it an even bigger fan. Um, Nalini Singh was just an absolute joy to to chat with. So I appreciate her making the time. Um, So thank you to her. Also, thank you to Erin at Berkeley Books for setting everything up. I really appreciate it. And I hope you guys really enjoyed getting to have a specific kind of more detailed chat about kind of how the series has come together. I was particularly interested to hear her thoughts sort of about authorial intent. um, And I'm definitely going to keep that kind of in mind going forward, uh, that apparently she's cool for us to (laughs) draw what connections we will. So I'm going to feel licensed to do that um, as we go along. But also, after we stopped recording, I, I shared with her an idea I have of a fun bonus episode for you guys, and she was very supportive of that. So I'm going to start... I'm going to start working on that for when we get to book 12. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to release that as a bonus episode. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the potential rustling in the background of my cats getting into a stack of papers and chewing them up. The stack just keep in mind this stack of papers has literally been sitting there for I don't know, 3 weeks and as soon as I'm having like a podcast recording, of course Hastings finds it and starts chewing it. So I had to try- try to jump over and uh, get him to stop doing that. So if you heard any rustling in the background, that is what it was. Enjoy, enjoy that little audio. So once again, big thank you to Nalini Singh. And I hope you guys enjoyed this bonus episode of Changeling Cast. Uh, If you did, please take a minute to rate and review, share it with your friends who also enjoy paranormal series and particularly side changeling series. And uh, if you're interested in following me, I am at books like whoa everywhere youtube instagram twitter goodreads all the things you can find me at books like whoa and yeah that is it for this week's bonus episode we will be back next week with i believe the seventh book is blaze of memory so 
strap in for that. And uh, I hope you guys are having a lovely day. I will talk to you soon. Bye.